I want you to understand that if you bear his name, you get to join the heavenly choir singing, worthy is the lamb. Holy is his name. No matter where you are in your relationship, you can join the heavenly choir. If you bear the name of Jesus, if you have a relationship, you can cry, holy. Would you pray with me as we get ready to open his word? God, we come before you asking for your favor, asking for you to clear our hearts, clear our minds so that we can hear from you. God, I stand on this stage not so people can hear me, but so they can hear you. God, you speak and we'll listen. God, as we open your word, reveal to us the things you would want us to learn today in this very moment, in the very moment of our life where we are right now, you have a word for us. And we'll thank you and give you glory for it. Be with us now. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. We get to celebrate Jesus as our Lord and Savior today because of what he went through 2,000 years ago. Jesus went through the worst week of his life with me and mine and with you. He took all the pain, all the suffering. Last week, we started to look at the events of what we call the Holy Week now. But really, back then, it was just another Passover event. So if you got your Bible or your device, I want to go ahead and invite you to open it to Luke 22. That's where we're going to be today. And let me just encourage you as your pastor, be active in this. Grab a a note sheet at the door. Bring a notebook. Underline stuff. Make markings. Get involved. It is amazing what God might show you when you actively engage your senses in the Word of God. It might not come from me. You might get distracted, but it might be something you see in the Bible that's in your lap. See, last week we started in Luke 19 and the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And we saw people worshiping Jesus for what he had done, not for who he really was because they didn't really understand who he was. And if we want to go deep in our worship of Jesus, standing up here crying, holy, it has to be based on who he is, not what he's done in our life. And as we walk through this week, this holy week, there's a lot, obviously, that we're not going to be able to cover in this series. And so I want to just encourage you to to dive into your Bible to read the four gospel accounts of the holy week. You could do one each day or, or do it over the next couple of weeks leading up to Easter. But what we know is from the time we see Jesus enter Jerusalem that we looked at last week, there's a few things that we know he did. Okay. First, he went into the temple and he began flipping tables of the money changers. And he told them, listen to me, my house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. It wasn't about the money, it was about the heart. Then he debated with the chief priests and religious leaders about his authority. And in fact, he whooped them so bad that they couldn't even answer his questions. He showed his authority And then Jesus did a whole lot of teaching, the Olivet Discourse and stuff. He taught about taxes and he taught about marriage and he taught about the temple and he taught about his plan and his mission. And then on Wednesday of the Passion Week, what we see is Judas finally says, that's enough. He goes to the chief priests and officers and he begins to set up a plan to portray Jesus. Then Judas has the audacity to go back and be with the disciples and Jesus. And so we come to what we think is Thursday of that week, which is where we're going to pick up the story. Jesus has now sent his two disciples, we don't know who they are, ahead of the group to find the place for them to observe the Passover meal. Now, Jesus didn't have a house. He didn't have anything like that. And so the disciples followed the instructions and they find the place that Jesus has told them about. They are in the guest room, which is on the upper level of this person's home. Now it had to be a large enough room for all of the disciples to be on one side of the table. And, and we see that in our pictures, <laughs> right? He was on one side of the table. I'm gonna tell you right now, the photographer actually moved them to the other side of the table to take the picture. Um, And if you're tracking with me and you believe any of that, you need help. Um, But but what we see is it had to be a pretty good sized room because they would recline and they would lean. They wouldn't sit like we do around the table. 
And in all the other gospels, what we see is that Jesus gets up and he wraps himself. He takes off his outer coat and he wraps himself in a towel and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. Thus showing again, driving home the idea of being a servant. We're going to talk about that just a little bit later. But for now, let's get into this moment. It's Thursday of Passover week and Jesus gathers with his disciples. Luke 22, verse 14 is where we're going to start. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds, till it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. I just want to pause right there. So often we don't take time to look back on the situation as it unfolds. And it can be kind of hard for us to imagine what these statements from Jesus might have meant to the disciples because we have the whole story. But let's remember, they still don't really understand what is about to happen. With roughly, within roughly 24 hours, Jesus is going to be hanging on a cross. But they're still not really sure that, that that's what's going to happen and all that kind of stuff. And the statement that Jesus makes really grabs their attention. Now listen to the statement because this, this has kind of bothered me all week. I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I want you to think about that statement for just a second. First of all, you are eager to eat this Passover. Knowing it will be the last Passover with the disciples, you're eager to eat it. Jesus knows his life is coming to an end on the earth. And he is eager to spend time with his disciples before he suffers. Jesus knows what's coming. He knows the pain. He knows the sacrifice, the misery that is about to be released upon him. How can he be eager? Seems a little crazy. I would be like, I want to delay this as long as possible. Well, it's not crazy when you realize that this week, this experience of judgment and trials and beatings and the death of Jesus was always the plan. Jesus was on a mission and it was about to be fulfilled. You see, the heavenly desire of Jesus was always to redeem mankind. Now you gotta be careful when you use words like always. See, none of what was about to happen surprised Jesus. He even alluded to it when he said he wanted this meal before he suffered. He knew it was coming, but it was always his desire to redeem mankind. This is one of those things where we have to trust and believe that God is bigger than we are. From the moment of creation, actually before the moment of creation, God has already set in motion the plan to send Jesus to this world. That means that before we as humans had even had the chance to walk away from our relationship with God, thus needing a savior, he was already prepared for the moment. Look at what Paul writes in Ephesians. He says, for he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. This is why Jesus came to the earth. The plan all along for Jesus to go to the cross and pay the penalty for my sin and for yours. And we see this snapshot in this phrase where he says, I have eagerly desired to have this Passover with you before I suffer. We see this snapshot of the humanity of Jesus in the fact that he is going to suffer and the God nature of Jesus in his eagerness to go through it with his disciples. Because it was always his plan. Now Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. And, and I want to show you something. You see, it's Thursday evening. And they are about to participate in the Passover meal that has happened for hundreds of years. It's a little early as most people are going to be celebrating Passover the next day. You say, well, Scotty, can't do Passover when it's not Passover day. Well, technically, in the Jewish calendar, as soon as the sun went down, that started the next day. It wasn't like us where it's midnight and that starts a new day. But for them, it would be sundown. 
So the disciples and Jesus are participating in Passover on the day of Passover, albeit a few hours before everybody else. And there might have been a reason for this. Jesus may have planned this for a couple reasons that we're going to get to. But the obvious one is that Jesus knew what was going to transpire over the next 24 hours. And he wanted to have this meal first. And from all accounts, it seems like this meal itself was pretty much standard Passover meal. Now, usually, in all four accounts you read, usually the meal involves some sort of lamb. But in all four accounts, it doesn't seem like the disciples had a lamb to eat. Maybe they had a lamb, but not one that they could eat. You see, we know that they had some unleavened bread. And then they had some wine or you know, grape juice for those of us who want to think straight. And this is where we see Jesus take the Passover meal that has been celebrated and remembered for generations and generations of Jewish people. And he turns it into a moment to remember him. Luke 22, verse 17, it says, After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, in my quick study this week about Passover, there seems to be up to four cups of wine that were used in a Passover meal. Jesus passes one cup around and tells the disciples to divide it among themselves. And he said, hey, I won't drink of it again until the kingdom of God comes or his death is what he's kind of alluding to. And then he begins to use the bread and the wine that they are so comfortable with in Passover. So comfortable with. This is something that they just did. It probably became ritual. Okay, we got to do Passover. Okay, well, he takes these things And he passes one cup around and he tells the disciples to divide it, right? And he begins to use these things as symbols for the sacrifice that he is going to make. He hasn't done it yet. He is still teaching. And he uses something familiar, the Passover meal, to bring understanding to what was about to happen. And then he uses two words that would have grabbed the disciples' attention. The words new covenant. He said, this is my blood. The cup is the new covenant in my blood. See, we don't use the word covenant that often in 2024. And it's a churchy word. And basically, a covenant is a binding promise to another person that cannot be broken. All through the Old Testament, we see covenants. The word testament, actually, as in Old Testament, New Testament, is really another word for covenant. The covenant between God and Israel is that he would be their God and they would follow him. We talk about the marriage covenant, which I made to God for my wife, and she made to God for me. I did not make a covenant promise to my wife. I made a covenant promise to God for my wife. That's why just because you get divorced doesn't mean you ain't married. Yeah, that'll preach. Okay. (laughs) Some of you are like, "Hmm, hmm, Scott's meddling. All right. So Jesus takes the bread... And he holds it up and he breaks it. And he passes it around to the disciples saying, this is my body given for you. This meal used to remind you of the lamb that was slaughtered and the blood was put on your doorpost when I rescued you from Egypt that night. But now it's going to be a reminder of my body that's given for you. And then after dinner, he takes the cup and he holds it and he blesses it and he passes it around. Gross. He passes it around and says, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out, literally dumped out for you. They would have caught that symbolism. They would have understood the symbolism of a new covenant covenant you see you can't have a new covenant and an old covenant the old covenant was based on the sacrifices made at the temple now they may not have realized all that jesus was saying but they had to at least get the understanding that things were changing it wasn't going to be the same anymore 
The old way was that you took an unblemished, unspotted lamb or a turtle dove or whatever you could afford and you would give it to the priest and he would sacrifice it as a temporary covering of the sins of the people. Which is why they had to do it over and over and over again. See, but Jesus is the perfect lamb who takes away the sins of the world. This is a big change, and I don't want you to miss this. Jesus' sacrifice doesn't just cover my sins, it cleanses them. Every year, people would have to make sacrifice after sacrifice to make sure that they were covering their sins and remaining in right standing with God. The old covenant was this constant set of sacrifices that had to be made. Those sacrifices did not have the power to cleanse sin. But the shedding of blood would cover the sin. But with Jesus, it was different. Because Jesus lived a perfect life, he then became the perfect sacrifice. He wasn't tarnished by sin. And in the new covenant, Jesus doesn't just cover my sins, he cleanses them. Look at what it says in Hebrews 10. It says, first he said, sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. That sounds like the garden that we're going to talk about next week, right? He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy, pure, through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We're going to get ready and do communion here in just a moment. So if you need to get your supplies, please feel free. But I want you to understand something. The old covenant was sacrifice according to the law. But as Hebrews tells us, Jesus sets aside the first covenant to establish the second the new covenant. The first covenant was for the Jewish people in accordance with the Old Testament, the Torah. But it was never enough. It was never the plan. They never pleased God. They merely satisfied God temporarily. And don't miss this. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, we have been made holy. The sacrifice of Jesus doesn't just cover our sins, it cleanses our sins. The blood of Jesus makes us holy and set apart. It was made for all. This is the beauty of the sacrifice of Jesus. The blood of Jesus gives everyone an opportunity to sit at God's table. I've said for a long time that Christianity is the most exclusive religion there is in the world, but it's also the most inclusive. It's exclusive because you have to come through to, to faith through a belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the only way. Exclusive. You can't, all roads don't lead to heaven. So if you're listening to me today and you have never taken the step to put your faith in Jesus, then you will not have a home in heaven. It's that exclusive. But, and this is my favorite part, this is my favorite part. It's also so inclusive that it doesn't matter what you have done in your life. You could be the worst human being to ever live. It doesn't matter your ethnicity or whether you're male or female. If you want a relationship, Jesus died for all. And it's because of the blood of Jesus that everyone is given the opportunity to sit at God's table. And in this moment, we would absolutely be foolish if we didn't stop and participate in communion that Jesus set out in this passage. And so obviously, we're gonna go back to the words of Jesus. But first, I wanna give you an opportunity. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, this is your chance. All you need to do, and I don't wanna oversimplify it, to start a relationship with Jesus is admit that you need it. Admit that you are a sinner who has missed God's mark, who needs the covering of the blood of Jesus, that you need to be cleansed by the blood of the Holy Lamb of God. And then you just have to believe that Jesus came to this earth, did exactly what the Bible tells us to pay the penalty for your sin, for mine, and that he went to the cross, that he was crucified and buried, and three days later rose from the grave once and for all, defeating hell and the grave. 
If you're willing to do that, it is a simple conversation with Jesus himself. You can have it in your heart. There are no particular words, just you and Jesus. So you can start that relationship today. Then when we do this act of communion, you're going to be able to participate with us as a family member of God as we remember Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. For those of us who have a relationship with Jesus, we take this moment serious because it's our time to make sure our hearts are right, our spirits are right with our Savior, and our focus is on Him. So as we prepare to take communion, I'm just going to ask you to pray with me. God, Jesus, we come before you looking at your words in the Scripture as you set this ordinance for us to remember you until you come again. The words of Jesus. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. As it was established in the upper room with his disciples, let us pause and remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that gives you the opportunity to sit at the table. Now, Getting back to the story in Luke 22, the story begins to take a turn here. And and we're going to dive right into it. Jesus begins to break things down further. In Luke 22, verse 21, Jesus is doing the communion. He says, but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The son of man will go as it has been decreed, God's plan. But woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Now, I have to imagine that the vibe in the entire room all of a sudden changes in this moment. They were having a great time and Jesus was laying out the new covenant. He goes, hey, one of you sitting at this table is going to betray me. Jesus just led them in the establishment of the ordinance of communion and now he tells them that there is, not might, is someone at the table that is going to betray him. And that woe to that man. Now, we know that this is Judas. In fact, we know, thanks to the Bible, that Judas has already went the day before to the chief priests and religious leaders to agree to betray Jesus. And because of the Bible, we know exactly how it goes down here in a little bit. Colt's going to talk about that next week. You don't want to miss it. But it hit me hard, this. Even though Jesus was aware he still dined with Judas. Jesus knew Judas would betray him. Before the meal, before the communion, before they even went into the upper room, Jesus knows everything. And my guess is that when Judas came back from meeting with the religious leaders, Jesus might have looked at him and he knew. Judas wasn't going to tell him, but Jesus knew. And this is where we see Jesus as God. He knew that Judas was going to betray him and hand him over to be crucified, but he still dined with Judas. And God just asked me a simple question. Would I? Would I be willing to look at someone who I know did or is going to do me wrong and have dinner with them? Do I want to be like Jesus? I need to learn to. I don't even want to talk to my kids if they do something that I told them not to. Or if it goes really, really badly, I can't wait to talk to them. I don't think my kids have ever betrayed me. They better not. You hear that? All right. In my position as lead pastor, I know that there are people inside this church and there are people outside this church who don't mince words when talking about me. Would I dine with them? (laughs) 
Judas is going to betray Jesus and put him in the hands of people who want to kill him. And yet Jesus is like, hey, Judas, pass the salt. Not really, okay. But he, but he didn't kick Jesus, Judas out. He didn't single him out by name. He simply did what he was going to do and didn't let Judas' decision change the way he treated Judas. Now, he did warn Judas without naming him. Woe to that man was a huge thing coming from Jesus. Imagine if you were Judas. Let's just go back to the day. Imagine if you were Judas. You are sitting at this Passover meal thinking, nobody knows. Nobody knows. Dinner's going great. Later that night, I'm going to go lead the guards and the religious leaders right to Jesus, and they're going to pay me, and nobody knows. None of these guys at this table have any idea. And then he reaches for the bread, and Jesus' hand reaches for the bread, and Jesus goes, someone at this table is going to betray me. What do you think is going through Judas's mind? How, how, how did he know? Did he see me? Did, did he have somebody tell him? No, it couldn't be. And, there, and there's a lesson in this for us. You can hide things from people, but not from Jesus. Yet, <laughs> we all do it. Can we just be honest? We all do it. Some of us do it when we pray and we only want to give God little details. As if he doesn't know everything we've already done. Some of us try to make deals with God. Oh God, if you get me out of this exam. None of the disciples had any idea what G Judas was about to do, but Jesus did. See, Jesus knew everything that Judas had done, yet he dined with him. When Jesus went to the cross and took on him the sins of the world, that means he took on the sins of Judas. He took on the sins of the world, all of them. But yes, Scott, we know. No, no, no. But we don't act like we know. Because what that means is that the thing that you and I don't want to admit, admit to God, he already knows. Why are we so scared to admit it? Why are we so scared to say, hey, listen, you might be able to come in here and make everybody in this room think that you are some incredibly holy person who has conquered all their sin, but the reality is you are just like me. Sorry. We don't want to admit it. We're imperfect, we're sinful, and we're desperately needing to be honest and open with Jesus who loves us so much that he took that thing that we are so embarrassed to talk about, to admit that we did because we know it's wrong. He took it to the cross. That's why we talk all the time about being real people, admitting our faults. Being real doesn't mean we celebrate sin. It means that we just admit it's there and we lean into the hope of Jesus and his forgiveness. Are there consequences? Yes, there were for Judas. Jesus said, woe be to him. I don't know about you, that doesn't sound good. When you get to a place of spiritual maturity, you finally realize that you can hide things from people but not from Jesus. Well, what this did was this caused a discourse in the upper room. And what's interesting is the disciples begin to talk with each other about which one of them might betray Jesus. You know what that means? Every single one of them thought it could possibly be them. They all started talking about it. They all started talking about it. It didn't seem like any of them at this point were so egotistical that they thought, well, it ain't gonna be me. But then a weird thing happens. A human thing happens. They go from questioning who is going to portray Jesus to all of a sudden wondering, who is the greatest? Look at verse 24. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest 
and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Now, I don't dare throw rocks at the disciples because this is the way my brain works too. In one moment, I can easily admit that the human nature in me can cause me to walk away and betray God. But then in the same breath, I can prop myself up as someone who would even be considered to be great in the kingdom of God. That's the double-minded person. The disciples knew they were special. They were chosen by Jesus personally and spent three years walking alongside him in ministry. They had seen him do so much miracles, healings, teaching, shutting up the Pharisees. That's impressive. But what they didn't realize is what they didn't see him do. They didn't see him throw his power around. They didn't see him demand praise and worship and respect. And Jesus breaks it down. The rulers of the world hold their position of authority over people. I'm in charge. They rule with power and control. But for you, it's going to be different. You want to be great? You want to rule? then you should be the one who serves. In John 13, the parallel story of this Passover meal, Jesus actually takes off his outer robe, wraps himself in a towel, and begins to wash his disciples' feet. Now, the job of washing disciples' feet, washing people's feet, would have been for not just a servant in the house, the lowest servant in the house. Think about what was on their feet. They shared the road with donkeys and camels and... Jesus modeled servanthood. Listen, I am never more like Jesus than when I am serving others. Jesus is very simply putting a lesson into place. The kingdom of God is going to be different than the world. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Be like Jesus. Give your life in service to others. You know what Jesus is driving home? Your life is not about you. It's about me. It's about Jesus. And if you and I want to be like Jesus, we can't sit like the world does and worry about what's in it for us. What's best for me? No. Instead, we need to wrap ourselves in a towel and begin to wash each other's feet. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Serve. As Philippians says, don't look out for your own interest only, but take an interest in others. Think of others as better than yourselves. That's the mindset shift. I stand up here every week in a position of prominence in this place. I'm the lead pastor of Fairfield Christian Church. That's a big deal. No, it's not. It's not. What matters is whether or not I am serving you. I'm thinking about you. Jesus came to serve. And I'm never more like Jesus than when I am serving others. Jesus didn't need someone else to point out the way to serve. Though we have lots of opportunities, scheduled things for Kids Quest and the wave to greeters, to media, to more. Jesus made service a part of his life. As he went about each and every day, he served others. I am never more like Jesus than when I'm serving others. And that service is not in vain. Because you might be sitting there thinking, well, what's, what's in this for me? Hold on. While Jesus teaches that the way the world views greatness is different than the way God views greatness, he does provide some encouragement for his disciples. Let's look at what Jesus says to the disciples and then specifically to Peter. Verse 28. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That sounds pretty nice. But you got to be a servant. Then he goes, Simon, Simon, that's Peter, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. 
there is a special place in heaven for the disciples because they have, and in a few short days, will be put through trials that they can't even imagine. And Jesus wants them to understand that there will be a table much like the one they are sitting around in this upper room in the kingdom of God where they will eat and drink with Jesus. And then Jesus turns to Simon, as, or Peter. He says, I begin to wonder why he would single out Peter. And then I began to wonder why Satan would single out Peter. But then if we go back through the time that Jesus spent with his disciples in Matthew 16, we see Jesus had already told Peter that he was the rock that the church was going to be built on. Peter was a critical cog in the church getting off the ground in Acts 2. I get Peter. He was bold, a little cocky, maybe too full of himself at times. He was willing to stick his neck out when nobody else would. Peter would say things that all the other disciples thought but were too afraid to say. Peter often would put his foot in his mouth because of that. This is one of those times. Jesus tells Peter, Jesus tells Peter, Satan has specifically targeted you. This is a big deal because Satan can't be more than one place at one time. And he picks Peter. He wants to challenge and destroy Simon Peter. Jesus tells Peter that Jesus himself is praying that Peter's faith doesn't fail. I don't know if that challenges Peter's manly ego or what, but Peter kind of chests up and he says, hey, nothing will stop me. I am ready to go to prison and even to death with you. The reality is Peter probably meant it in that moment. It's easy to say in the upper room. We've all done that. But we know how the story plays out. He fails. He denies he even knows Jesus three times in the next 24 hours. But notice, Jesus knew that. He knew that. Go back to verse 32. He said, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. Look at this line. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. When you've turned back, Jesus knew he was going to fail. No big surprise there. But I think Jesus wanted to make sure Peter knew that even when I fail, I can always come back to Jesus. If, if Jesus gives this encouragement to one of the disciples that he spent years with, what does it mean for us? I find it interesting that it seems like Jesus points out that it wasn't necessarily Peter's faith that failed, it was his humanity. When Peter was faced within the moments of decision, he let his human nature and his fears take over. That's why he denied Jesus. It wasn't because he lost faith in Jesus. He knew who Jesus was. In fact, in Matthew 16, where Jesus calls him the rock of the church, Peter declared that Jesus was the Messiah. Peter knew. But when that moment came and he was faced with persecution, his fears won out. And he knew it. You can always come back to Jesus. Jesus took our failures to the cross and he forgave them. We can come back time and time and time again. Listen, I know each of us is in a different spot today. And this message kind of took us a lot of different places. We've talked about the fact that the blood of Jesus gives everyone the opportunity to sit at the table. And if that's you today, you need to take that opportunity. We have people who would love to sit with you and talk with you and pray with you and help you make that decision. We want you to start that relationship with him. Everybody who calls this place home should want you to start that relationship with him. Right, church? He loves you so much that all the things that he went through, the beatings, the cross, the pain, the agony, was all done to give you a relationship with him. Take it today. He offers it as a gift. Maybe you're, you're just challenged to stop casting so much judgment on the Judases of your life. Jesus still dying with him. You might be more like Judas than you really want to admit. Maybe you're feeling convicted about serving others. You want to be like Jesus, serve. Pour out your life in service to those around you. It doesn't matter your position in the world, whether you may be the CEO, you may be the low man on the totem pole. Serve, think of others as better than yourselves. Or today, you might be sitting here feeling like an absolute failure good news. 
This Bible is full of absolute failures. It's full of absolute failures. This is a room full of people that have failed Jesus at one point or another. You can always come back to Jesus. Maybe you need to hit your knees at this altar and thank God for second chances. I'm going to tell you right now, I am going to go off the stage and I'm going to be right here. You feel free to join me because I am so thankful for second chances. However God is moving in your life, let me invite you to make room for Jesus. If he is working on you, let him work. We got people who would love to pray with you, pray for you, pray beside you, pray over you. We have elders who would love to sit with you and help you take that next step, whatever it may be in your life. Let this moment be the moment where you lay it down, where you surrender to whatever God has for you. Make room for Jesus to do whatever he wants to do in your life. You will never regret it. God, we come to you today. God, I can't speak for the hundreds in here. I can speak for myself. God, again today, I surrender. God, if there's a little bit of Judas in me, help me remove it. If there's a little bit of arrogance like Peter, help me get rid of it. God, if there's moments where I think of myself better than other people, correct me. Today, again, I come back to you laying it down to do whatever you want to do. Be with us today as we respond to your word. It's in your name we pray.